historically, we know that people lived more in communities where maybe your aunt or your sister or your mom was with you in your dwelling or in your hut or in wherever. And now we don't have that. So we have to get other people that are in our lives, in our communities, so that that way they can be a part of supporting us as we sleep. I tell people, don't worry, all is not lost. You're gonna be able to sleep. You just have to be really, really intentional about it and thoughtful about it. Some of the ways that people can do that are, number one, making sure that if they have a partner at home, that that person is an equal player with them. Mm -hmm. Tell them, we're in a new era, ladies. <laughs> it's time for us all to kind of be banding together um, as partners um, together. So I tell people, especially if they're breastfeeding, if you're the breastfeeder in chief, your partner is the soother in chief. That's great. <laughs> right? That. Yeah. yeah. That cool. came from one of my partners at work yeah. who tells people that. And he's a guy. So I think when he looks at, yes. at guys, if, if it's a, a male partner, then they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I look at them, I feel like it's still taking a little bit of time for them to hear that from me. But the moms, I see them just nodding. We need our partners because that helps then our partners to feel really confident and calm when they're with their babies too, to bond with them. It's yeah. a win-win. I, I yeah. can totally resonate with all of that. And I just, um, one thing that I found that's so hard is as postpartum women, I mean, if you are, you know, if your partner is, your spouse is, is male and, um, you know, you we tend to kind of micromanage a little bit. Yes. And then we're resentful that our partner isn't stepping up and, you know, being the soother or changing as many diapers. And so, you know, how do you help moms navigate that? Because we're so used to, you know, being the planners and, and being the managers. Yeah. How, what do you say to them about that? Yeah, hundred percent agree with that. <laughs> that happens in my house too still. <laughs> still working on that. I uh, want to get it figured out, then I'll let you know. But, but I do think there are ways. One of the number one ways is to honestly leave leave that. Oh. Let your partner just be in charge of your baby without you there hovering. Go for five minutes to a coffee shop and get a cup of tea. It's good for you. It's good for your partner to figure it out. Your baby will survive for five minutes while you go someplace, <laughs> right? Go outside and listen to the birds or put headphones on or go take a shower. Intentionally give space for your partner to be there without you there. Mm. Um, I think the other is communication right? And that's a hard thing to do. But to say to your partner, here are the things that I am worried about with our baby. Here are the things that I want to learn together about our baby. Having partners be part of all the prenatal classes as much as possible. Having them be the person that reads the book, I think is important. I mean, when I first had my daughter, I told my husband, listen, I know a lot of stuff from a pediatrician level, Deal, but you are a really good problem solver. You're better than I am at some of these things. You're going to be better able to figure out how to exactly have her in the car seat or put things together. So giving them kind of, here are the tasks that need to be done. Here's the list of things. What are the things we need to accomplish to get ready for this baby or now that this baby is here and then letting them really take ownership. Just talking with you is making me think about like really what I tell a lot of moms to prepare for that postpartum time is there's so much you can do while you're pregnant or even before conception, like in terms of being more intentional, yes. you know? And so um, what are some of the things, you, you know, that you would say to some of the prenatal women about how they can maybe um, prevent some of this, you know, just sort of get a jump start on that postpartum time? Yeah, absolutely. I think number one is figuring out fitness wise. I'm a huge believer in fitness. I know you are too, obviously. <laughs> um, having practice times for fitness that then set you up for success yeah. later, rituals that you do, right? You might not be able to go back to yoga or Pilates quite in the same way that you did in the beginning, but there are programs like yours that allow people to do things at home that start with gentle stretches. Um, yoga doesn't have to be physical. It can be just the breathing and the mindfulness and all of that. So I think those are really good, um, really good opportunities. The other thing I talk to people about is when they're thinking about their registries, Thinking about what resources do you actually need? You have a pool of money. We all have different amounts of money in that pool. What is actually gonna help you the most? I know it's really hard in our society because we have all the ads and the stuff that tells us we should buy 80 million items for our kids, but your baby does not need a wipe warmer. Invest your money in people coming to your home and helping you. Invest your money in saving for a vacation away from your child at the one-year mark so you have something to look forward to. 
Invest your money in therapy with your partner if you need to, or for yourself. Invest your money in fitness things that are about mindfulness. Mm -hmm. It's like what you're saying is, you know, you're worth it. You're worth making yourself a priority, whether it's for fitness or time away or organize, organizing your life or whatever it is. And I think it's so often that the baby comes and all of a sudden all that goes out the window and, the, and 100% of the focus is on the baby. But what I hear you saying is, hey, mom, you know, you're worth it to take the time, you know, to, to get organized and to get your life sort of set up so that you can thrive. I mean, it, it will be hard. It is hard. Yeah, it is. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think about self-care like, this is going to sound extreme, but I think about it like insulin for someone who has diabetes. <laughs> I think about it like it's essential, like we can't survive without self-care. Mm -hmm. And I think in our society, we have self-care as this like little weird, like you need to get a coffee every day mm -hmm. or you need to like get your nails painted or whatever. That's not what I mean. Sometimes self-care can mean that, but I think much more often it means you're taking a moment for yourself. I think it means you're doing the things you need that feed you. Um, for me, it's getting together one-on-one -on -one with someone who understands me and knows me with a close friend. For my husband, it's having a party with like 80 million people, right? Mm -hmm. It's different, different. For, different for every single person. For me, self-care also meant going back to work, um, at least part-time. You know, having lunch without a child on me, you know, and everybody has a different journey with that. Um, some people, they are happiest when they're with their kids all day long and they're with other moms at the park or whatever. For me, part of it was just my passions, my things that I've always cared about, making sure that I didn't lose that. Because I want my kids to feel passionate about their things too.